Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Burning Platform. I've invited my old gardener colleague, Dan Miklovic, to join us today. And this is going to be a very blue collar, industrial, gritty discussion because we have way too much conversation about digital stuff. Dan, great to have you. It's been a while since we've talked. Tell us a little bit about, tell, tell the audience about your background, brag about yourself. All right. Well, happy to, honey, and it's good to be uh, talking to you again. Uh, I always enjoy conversations with my fellow uh, realistic skeptics. <laughs> um, Speak for yourself. <laughs> I, uh, I've been in the manufacturing space for 50 years. I, um, after I got out of college, I went to work in industry uh, with Weyerhaeuser. I've also worked on the vendor side uh, with a company that ultimately got acquired by Aspen Technology, where I was head of marketing. Uh, on the end user side, I've worked in sawmills, paper mills, plywood plants, uh, electrical motor manufacturing, chemical manufacturing. Uh, and I worked in the consulting side of the business as a uh, engineer for an architecture and engineering and construction firm, and then ultimately moved to uh, Gartner, where, uh, if you remember, you were actually part of the interview team that uh, I interviewed with when I joined Gartner, where I spent uh, 15 years. Was that nice that I, I, don't that. I don't remember that. Was that nice? Team? Yeah, it was you, um, Eric Keller, and others uh, back when I came in. And uh, you, you actually told me I was the first person in an interview that actually made Eric Keller shut up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was an interesting time. And I spent 15 years at Gartner. And then I... Uh, Went out on my own. I spent five years at a company called LNS Research out of Boston. And for the last couple of years, I'm semi-retired, but I work with a group called the Analyst Syndicate, where I do a lot of work on, uh, you know, advising both vendors on how to approach the market and end users on how to select technology. Well, you know, as analysts, we love acronyms and we love buzzwords, right? So in the industrial sector, we've got industry 4.0, we've got IoT, I mean, a whole bunch of buzzwords. And then obviously acronyms you and I unleashed on the world, SIM and ERP and enterprise asset management and so on. When you look at all these alphabet um, soup, what is really truly promising you know, which is going to make manufacturing much more profitable, much more, make it, make it attractive again. Well, then, you know, it's an interesting proposition there, you know, the acronyms, technology, how is manufacturing changing? Well, you know, before I talk about how the technology of the software and the IT is changing, let's talk about how manufacturing is changing. I'm going to use a very personal example. About 10 years ago, I lost a uh, tooth how to get a dental implant. It required like six trips to the dentist. It took multiple impressions. It took, uh, you know, months and months, almost 10 months to get it done. Uh, it was really time consuming. Uh, I broke a tooth a couple of weeks ago, went in, it was, they did a laser scan, made a 3D, you know, model of my mouth, pulled the broken tooth out, uh, put the implant in. I've got to wait like two or three months for the implant to uh, seat into the bone. And I go back and in one trip, they're going to use a 3D printer to print a ceramic replacement tooth. That uh, So what, what was six trips before, it's going to become two or three. What was 10 months is going to be three. You know, so I think we're seeing that in other forms of manufacturing as well. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing this decentralization of manufacturing. We're seeing new manufacturing models with services and other things coming in. So <clears throat> it, it's an exciting time to be in manufacturing because it's changing. But not only is the way manufacturing is changing uh, related to the actual physical supply chains and everything else, it's also the technology. You know, back when... Uh, you know, I came into Gartner, uh, you're right, we had ERP, we had an ERP group, we had a SIM group that covered MES, we had, and PLM, 
You know, we, we had all these very separate disciplines because the technologies were different. Um, PLM needed high volume data processing at high speed to do all of the engineering renderings and everything. ERP had high data, but didn't have the speed requirements, but it had lots and lots of data. And then there was the manufacturing operations software that had all of the you know needed speed because you were controlling real-time processes, but the data volumes were low. But as, as we've shifted to new technology, as we've moved into the metaverse and we, you know, business systems are now having to contain configuration files for the software and products and engineering systems are doing virtual reality and the analytics that are being applied on the shop floor and each huge data sets to work properly. We're seeing this convergence of technology so that you know, the delineation between what you, the skills you need to do ERP, PLM, and MES and other operational systems on the plant floor, they're all starting to converge. So, you know, the IT OT convergence that, uh, you know, Gartner coined some 10 years ago almost um, is now pretty much irrelevant in the sense that it's happening not because of some. Uh, organizational issue or the silos being torn down. It's because the technology is truly converging. And, and it's an exciting time for manufacturing in that it's going to change, you know, it's enabling these shifts from, you know, large scale mega factories that make, you know, huge assembly lines of products and everything else to much smaller manufacturing that can produce a variety of things. So, um, it's going to be a challenge, though, because we've got to make this manufacturing technology simpler to use. I, I look at my own home. You know, I've got a smart thermostat. And while I am capable, uh, I'm a double E. I mean, that's my bachelor's degree is in electrical engineering. And so, you know, if, if worse came to worse, I can sit there and uh, build my own thermostat, if you will. But for most people, the, the technology is such that we should be able to do in our factories what we do in our home, which is, you know, I go put my Ecobee thermostat up on the wall. Um, I get on my smartphone and I tell it what kind of temperature profile I want. You know, it should be as easy in manufacturing for you to go put a new oven, you know, an autoclave in to make a composite wing structure for an airplane. And you should be able to tell that autoclave, you know, cook it this long at this temperature, at this pressure. And then, you know, let it, it's, it's like my Ninja Foodie even, you know, I tell it how much time I want it to do at what pressure and how much of a cool down cycle I want and when to release the pressure. And then, you know, all I have to do is take the pressure lid off, put the browning lid down and, you know, it takes a couple of steps and I can do what is a multi-step process because yeah. the technology allows me to do that. You know, you're right. It is an exciting time. I helped a CEO narrated book last year about how product companies are moving more into services, right? So business models are moving to subscription, more outcome-based um, models and so on. And that's less to do with the shop floor. It's more to do with the contract systems and the you know, change in field, a lot more focus on field maintenance, field service and so on, and augmented reality in the field and so on. But it is definitely shifting in many different directions. But there are going to be some challenges. I mean, you know, we, we aren't turning out enough STEM graduates. We don't have enough data scientists to use the technology that we've got today. We don't have um, the domain experts. You know, it, there's a lot of attractiveness in becoming an influencer and making, you know, a uh, couple hundred thousand dollars as a uh, influencer in a year, as opposed to making a hundred thousand dollars as an engineer having to solve real problem. You know, it's a bit like your house. There are people who have um, implemented every piece of technology and, you know, their house is a technological wonder. But is it really any more comfortable than the person that has, you know, a modicum of technology? You know, the couple of smart thermostats, uh, you know, a couple of lights that they can turn on and off easily and program. Um, right. You know, I guess you can compare it to a car too, right? 
right. the point where you have so many new gadgets and so many new features that it's overwhelming, right? I mean, well, and it creates problems. I mean, you know, it's if you look at the recent news around John Deere and all of the uh, legislation that's being promoted about, you know, the right to repair, they call it. Yeah. And it's all because technology has gotten so complex that you if you if it's you know if the technology fails you can't do your work and, and that's the problem with smart factories is you know we're, we're building all these smart factories supposedly well what happens when the technology fails and, and trust me I, I appreciate that to a certain degree we're in the middle of a blizzard here in the midwest today and uh, you know I have internet and backup internet and my primary internet used to be starlink uh, and I had a low speed cable backup. I recently switched to a fiber as my primary with uh, Starlink as my backup. And guess what? Uh, the Starlink dishes froze up. The, the ice got too much for its internal heating system to, to recover. So I'm glad I got that backup. But if I only had the one, I'd be out of luck. I couldn't, you know, there's things I couldn't do with the smart systems in my house. Fortunately, I'm smart enough to know how to, you know, set up a local Wi-Fi and make it work. But, you know, a lot of people aren't. And that's the problem with, you know, the whole technology and the manufacturing. There's, there's this, you know, idea that we're going to bring technology back to our shores. We're going to, you know, the supply chain crunch, for example. You know, uh, Intel just announced they're going to build, you know, $20 billion worth of factory in Ohio. Well, unfortunately, um, you know, they're not going to build that next year, partly because the it takes a long time to build these things, partly because it takes a long time to get the people smart enough to run them. And, you know, a lot of the technology needed to make a smart factory comes from overseas now. So, it's just we've, we've built ourselves into this uh, overly complex environment. Instead, you know, there aren't enough data scientists to use all the AI applications that are trying to be pushed at manufacturers today. Um, th there aren't enough statisticians to analyze all the data that they're promised, to, you know, that they're getting from all this IoT that they've invested in. Um, you know, I don't need, but, but, but you know, how does a so let, let me let me give you the other point of view, right? We do have examples like a Google, like most of the hyperscalers, Amazon. They've shown that you can do a lot of stuff once you have data, right? So why why would that not, with the right talent, work for an, at least a decent sized manufacturer, maybe not a smaller. Smaller firm couldn't afford all the talent and all the technology, but for a deer or a caterpillar or you know a GM and so on, why won't it work for them? Well, if you have enough money, it will. But unfortunately for us, the the general public, the vast majority of manufacturing is dependent on the mid market because the big guys don't make things anymore; they assemble things. They bring components together and put them together. It's the problem is not GM's ability to assemble a car. It's GM's problem and Ford's problem and Gears problem and the rest are getting the parts to put the car together. And it's those mid-tier manufacturers that can't afford the technology. So clearly there's been a lot of talk about bringing manufacturing back, right? Or nearshoring. Right. Uh, at least. I mean, in North, North America, rather than across a very long supply chain. What 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 do you find? What are the big issues? Is it the capex issues because it's going to take a lot of dollars, or is it a talent issue, or are there what 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 are you finding? Why, why is it much slower than it should be? Well, there's plenty of money. It's just that it prefers the easy money of NFTs, cryptocurrency. You know, ga gamblers like to go for the uh, easy money and manufacturing's never been easy. It's hard. It takes work. You know, it's not like um, gambling on Wall Street. It's not like gambling on NFTs. It's not like being an influencer. It takes real work 
to do manufacturing. Oh, so, that sounds personal here, Dan. It is. <laughs> um, so, so money's available. It's just that there aren't the right incentives. So I would say it's not a CapEx. It's the way we reward the use of money. It's, so it's in some respects, it's political in the sense of we don't have the right incentives. Uh, is it a talent shortage? Absolutely. Um, we outsource so much manufacturing that the ability to design and make manufacturing systems is in short supply because we've outsourced that as well. Now, you're but right. Honestly, but if you look at Amazon, right, they have compensated by, for it by more automation. So in a distribution center in Amazon, you got miles of conveyor belts, you've got all the Kiva robots running around, you got, you know, basic, the packing station, the thing even, the darn thing even cuts the right amount of tape for the person who's working there. So they've dumbed down talent-wise what we need. Can we do that in manufacturing? Sure we can, uh, if, if we're willing to put in the effort that Amazon's put in. For example, you know, they have their own academy to teach robotics engineers how to service and maintain robots because they've got so many of them, they can't find workers to maintain them. So they've had to train their own. Yeah. And more importantly, they're in such short supply they have spare robots just waiting to be thrown on the shop floor when one breaks, and then they can send a roving team of specialists in to repair the broken ones that are piling up in the corner. How many other manufacturers can afford to do that? Well, you would think the bigger ones, or at least, uh, how about contract manufacturers then? I mean, a Fox well, can do that. Again, it is all a matter of scale and perspective. And so, yes, it is doable. And yes, that's the, the solution is to figure out these new supply chains, the new mechanisms to do this. And, and Amazon is doing a lot of good stuff. Um, Amazon is building sensors that anybody can deploy and use on AWS that allows you to do predictive analytics. But up until now, you had to have a very proprietary, skilled engineers to use, you know, proprietary sensors, they had to have networking specialists to hook it all together, you had to have data scientists to figure out what to do with it, you had to have domain experts to build, you know, to identify the problems, you can go to Amazon and buy it. The, the real challenge is, it's still only going to solve base level problems because it's too generic. Yep. Manufacturing always has had, you know, the 80% is easy to get. It's that last 20. And you get into process issue, process manufacturing issues very different than. Sure. The, so you mentioned smart factories earlier. And you also mentioned they're not very smart. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, we, we put so much technology in to plants these days that we don't know what to do with it. And, and you know, if you read the literature, you know, 16, 17, 20 percent of all systems, you know, implementations are successful. The rest fail. Why? Well, because it, they're drowning in information. IoT is making people they have more information than they know what to do with. Um, that's part of the problem. And when, you, when you're faced with overwhelming data, oftentimes people just do nothing. That's the, the natural human don't, reaction. Don't, don't we have filtering technologies so we only exceptions get reported? Isn't that one way around it? Well, except that what's an exception? The, the, the argument from the AI folks and the machine learning folks is, you know, you need all this data to find the hidden linkages, the things that are really causing you problems. So it creates this issue of um, how, do I, how do I know what data is the right data to look at? And that's where the data scientists come in. So, yeah, I mean, Smart factories are dumb because A, we don't have the systems in place to, to take all of the data and filter it properly. And they're dumb because they don't, the systems don't talk to each other well yet. I mean, it's far better than it used to be, 
um, you know, back, oh, in the 80s, for example, 40 years ago, um, they wouldn't even talk at all. Now, at least we can get the data between the systems, but they use different architectural models, different data definitions. You know, there's no common language. And so they're dumb in the sense that they're smart in their own little area, but they're often counterproductive in the sense that they're doing point optimization and when I optimize around one area, I can optimize my quality and my production rate, but I might be using excessive energy to do that, or I might be slowing the, the line down so you know, to get Hockham, the quality. So how come, you know, even in the smart home, you got the Zigbee's and so on that have been trying to come up with an overall architecture, right? Why is it not happening in the, you know, across, across all the, PLM and the MES and the, you know, all the, all the different CAD and the whole thing. Why is, are we not coming up with common languages? Well, it, it, we, we are, it's slow, but the problem with standards in the industrial sector is this, the, the market isn't big enough for everyone to get a piece of the pie and prosper. So there's too much interfighting between the major players because the cost to do this well is not shareable across a large enough user base like it is in the consumer sector. You know, how many millions and billions of iPhones are there out there in the world or Android phones? Well, you know, building an app for them, building a standard to share data across those apps, everything else makes sense because it's the cost can be spread so broadly in the consumer sector. When you get to the industrial sector, there's a finite amount of money and a finite amount of market and everybody's fighting to win. And so there's not a lot of incentive to... Um, cooperate too much there's an incentive to cooperate because you can't win them all and you know you're going to have to work with some others but you don't want standards because if you get too many good standards then things start to get commoditized and, and it's a race to the lowest cost like it is in the consumer sector and because again because the market base isn't broad enough lowest cost won't work One thing that I've been fascinated by is, you know, obviously as a as consumers, we want more and more features, and that usually translates to more sensors, more software in the products. The products are becoming smarter. Every everything we have at home has become smart in the last 10, 15 years, right? That was I hadn't thought through the ripple effect that has on supply chains and manufacturing, though. I mean, it's becoming very obvious now. We can see chips have uh, it, it's small minor chips are the big bottleneck right now, right? Because those are driving individual features in cars and so on. But even more, you know, to me, the bill of materials must have become so much more complex now, right? Because these, they all have to be, all these sensors have to be embedded, different modules have, been, have to be embedded and so on. Have you made it too complex, this whole move to smart products? I don't think we've made it too complex, but there's a basic truism is you can't make smart products in a dumb factory. It's impossible. <laughs> um, but you are right. I mean, when the variation in the functionality of a product can be defined by software, the manufacturing system that produces the device must be able to program the device itself not just the robots that make the device. And so code becomes part of the bill of materials, you know, the whole mechatronics issue. And the, the challenge is, again, you know, it's one thing to train a person to download software to a um, CNC machine. It's another thing and, and to validate that it's right because you can always run the piece and if it doesn't turn out right, 
you adjust the software and make another piece and you throw the first one away. <clears throat> it's a little tougher if I'm downloading software to my product, then I need to test it right away to make sure that it was loaded properly, which becomes difficult if it's only partly constructed. And then I need to validate that it's correct. And so it's no longer just, you know, do it and observe the physical result. I'm, I'm doing diagnostics now. So the person assembling it has to be smarter. You, you can't have, or you have to have automation, which does that. And now the automation itself is more complex. It's a cascading problem. So how, you know, let's step aside from the US for a minute. How are the Germans doing it? How are the Chinese doing it? How are the Japanese doing it? How are the Czechs doing it? I mean, there are some countries that have not, you know, we gutted out our core manufacturing capabilities over the last 30 years. But a number of countries didn't do that, right? Are they having more success with next generation industry 4.0 or is well, it to a certain degree? Yeah, because they put more emphasis on STEM education. Um, manufacturing in those companies is in those countries is uh, rewarded higher. It's uh, a better place to work. Um, there's less incentive to try to become an influencer than an engineer. Um, you know, so yeah, they, they are better off. It's, it's, again, it comes back to, you know, the strategic direction that this country has taken over the last 20 years or so, putting an emphasis on services and um, on, you know, finance, on uh, the, the whole creative process as opposed to the manufacturing process, you know, putting emphasis on uh, being an influencer over an engineer is something that we've got to change. We've got to make manufacturing a re rewarding and uh, both rewarding financially and rewarding intellectually career. Now you're sounding like Mike Rowe. Let's, let's get back into trade schools and get away from Ivy League, uh, liberal arts type stuff. Well, I'm not saying get away from higher education because, you know, it's a cascading thing. You need a pyramid of skills. Yes, trade schools are important, but so are the PhD students. I mean, you know, the, the challenge we've had in the last several years is many of the STEM doctoral students have been incented to actually leave the U.S. and go back to their home countries where they came from and establish businesses there. And that's been part of our job. What else? What excites you about the manufacturing sector or the industrial sector broadly? Well, it isn't going to go away. We need stuff. Um, you know, without manufacturing, A, we wouldn't have the technology we're talking on today. You wouldn't have the closure wearing. Um, you know, manufacturing is fundamental to everything we do. And if you don't do it, life isn't going to continue as we know it. So hence, it's not going to go away. So it's exciting to know that these are all problems that we're going to solve. I don't know if we're going to solve them tomorrow, but, you know, I'm, we're already seeing a change in um, some of the funding that's being proposed and some of the um, directions that we've seen in the last four or five years on STEM. So, uh, you know, the good news is it is going to, uh, it's going to continue. It's going to get better. It's just that we need to make sure that we're putting the money in the right place and doing the right things. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult. But hey, it's the difficult things, solving difficult problems, which are fun. Certainly, Elon Musk would agree. I mean, yeah. Even even though his Starlink is causing you problems, uh, yeah. Well, it's because I don't have any cats to lay on it and keep the snow <laughs> off. Dan, a real pleasure to reconnect. Thank you again yep. for your time. Stay optimistic. Like always. We 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 we. 
we, we need to give much more love and attention to the manufacturing sectors. 